Hey everyone, Eric Watson here, freelance writer, player of games, writer of words, recorder of videos, and online role-playing aficionado. Welcome to another Roll20 review, my written and video review series, where I took a look at the marketplace section of online role-playing website Roll20.net. With this video, we'll be looking at the Roll20 adaptation of the very first officially published full 5th edition campaign, Tyranny of Dragons, which is launching today, October 31st, on Roll20.net. Hey, happy Halloween! <laughs> A Tyranny of Dragons was released as two separate modules uh, back in 2014, Horde of the Dragon Queen and Rise of Tiamat. The Horde of the Dragon Queen actually predates the 5th edition Player's Handbook and Dungeon Master's Guide, while both modules hit before the official Monster Manual. For that reason, the Tyranny of Dragons is a bit simpler and more railroady than later adventures, using the more traditional monsters found in Faerun, Forgotten Realms, like dragons. It features a likewise very traditional plot, an evil cult focused around dragons, causing trouble around the world, culminating uh, eventually in bringing back the evil dragon goddess Tiamat to the world. Adventurers will have to thwart their every turn while courting allies by uniting the various races and factions of the world against this apocalyptic threat. Now, both modules are available separately on Roll20 for $30 each, or you can buy them bundled together for the standard, uh, now standard campaign price of $50. Note that even the bundle still grants two separate modules, uh, you'll need to use the Character Vault to import export characters to move between them. Let's move over to my Roll20 screen. So I'm going to be covering the two modules kind of one after the other, but this I'm only going to be doing the one review and one uh, written review for the overall uh, Tyranny of Dragons bundle. But let's go ahead and do Horde of the Dragon Queen. So you get the following content in the 2995 Horde of the Dragon Queen module. Seven five-foot battle maps. Let's see maps up here. Uh, all the maps have dynamic lighting if you're a Roll20 subscriber. It's pretty standard in all of Roll20's uh, paid modules. Two 10-foot battle maps. And by the way, those seven 5-foot battle maps only encompass four actual locations. There's <laughs> there's more dungeons than it seems like because a lot of these uh, dungeons are multiple levels. Uh, two 10-foot battle maps with uh, five foot sub adjusted 5-foot subdivision grids. Three 20-foot battle maps, which are all one location, also with five foot subdivisions. Two non-gridded maps, the town of Greenest and the uh, Colts uh, Raider Camp. One overland map of the Sword Coast. You also get six five foot original battle maps for Roll20, uh, which are a town, camp, forest, swamp, and the same road map in both the day and night. And we'll be looking at those uh, in a little bit, but that's a really cool addition they made. You get 20 tokens for all the potential caravan travelers in episodes four and five, although they don't come with any pictures or handouts, as they didn't have any in the uh, original published adventure. You get 23 named NPC character sheets with matching tokens, 16 of which have pictures and handouts. Over 70 monster NPC sheets with draggable tokens, vision, and separate player handouts. Uh, rollable tokens for shape-shifting creatures, which has become pretty standard in all their uh, uh, official D&D adaptations. 17 magic item player handouts, 6 of them have pictures. The full adventure journal organized into eight episodes, each containing um, all the DM notes and player handouts from the adventure. You get uh, rollable tables for random encounters in the uh, setup as macros. You also, of course, get the fully searchable database, courtesy of the standards rule document for 5th edition. Now, Tyranny of Dragons, I'm not going to, I'm trying not to delve into it too much because it's a three-year-old adventure at this point, but it has some problems. Um, it has problems story-wise, and it unfortunately has problems with translating it into a virtual tabletop space like Roll20, and we're going to jump right into that. I think it's just kind of a messy adventure. <laughs> it relies on way too big battle maps, and a large chunk of the middle of the adventure is devoted to a horrifically lengthy road trip, the infamous episode four, which has been much derided, and I'm not going to go into it too much, but it has some problems. All right, the adventure starts, uh, it, it, it starts, it begins and ends very well, I'll say that. The unfortunate thing about the beginning is the beginning maps don't actually use the gridded maps at all. It starts off in Greenest, uh, where the players are attacked, uh, uh, the, the town is attacked by the dragon cult, uh, complete with actual blue dragon involved, which is really nifty. Obviously, the players are level one, so they shouldn't be tangling with that. They should instead be trying to save people, which I always like to see that in D&D adventures. I like to run them basically like superhero comic books where your players are actual heroes. 
And this is a really fun map on here. You can see that Roll20 does the nice thing of adding uh, all the extra random encounters that can be on here, including the like random encounter die roll you're supposed to give for these specific encounters, which is really nifty. Uh, you can see there's episode one encounters right here. We can roll that. Uh, and I rolled uh, the townsfolk are hiding, so you find the hidden townsfolk. <laughs> um, but they're all in the GM layer. I think every single token on this map is on the GM layer, so you can certainly use it for getting around. And it does have the correct size. Uh, so their distance is correct in terms of getting from one area to another, which is nice. However, obviously the tokens are about 20 feet across. Uh, actually, about looks like yeah, you know, yeah, about 20. So you'll have to abstract combat somewhat if you actually want to use this as a battle space. However, what Roll20 has done, um, and this is the first time I've seen it used, is they provide these random battle maps, which are just extra battle maps you can use uh, wherever. And you could, for example, use this random town map and literally almost do it like a JRPG where you know, you're know you on the overland map and you, you, know, the, you occur... You know, with enemies, or you find a wandering enemy, or whatever, and it shifts to that other screen where it actually you battle them. You could do that here and just kind of do a zoomed-in format, and that allows you to actually use these five-foot grids. And this, these all do have dynamic lighting in place. You'll need to actually enable it on the map settings of the map. And obviously, this map does not pretend to even translate to what's happening on the other map. This is just, you know, a random one that Roll Twenty has. You could sit here and you know, go to the map section and rotate it and cut off sections with dynamic lighting. And, you know, you could use as much of this map as possible while still using the same map. But I think it's a really nice feature, especially with Tyranny of Dragons, because there's not a whole lot of maps here. And there are a lot of sections that rely on random encounters. So it comes in hugely helpful. Uh, and the town map is a great example to use for Greenest. And unfortunately from there, the first two maps, non-gridded, um, Raider Camp, as well, it's it would be very odd if this is your first Roll20 experience and you're jumping into Horde of the Dragon Queen and you're like, wait, this is supposed to be a virtual tabletop, but there's not any grids? No, there's not. <laughs> it's just it's just the way that these maps were created, unfortunately. This is very early on in their 5th edition process, and it kind of predates a lot of what they used for standard uh, map-making tools, and I did not like how they do the maps here very much at all. The adventure is also very linear, which your players may or may not appreciate. You should definitely know that ahead of time before jumping into it. Um, but essentially, your players are pulled from one location to the next uh, fairly directly. Um, so you go from there. Uh, the raider camp just seems needlessly large, which is very much a reoccurring theme. Um, but it does provide you know extra tokens that you'll need on the battle map, which is nice. Uh, the players are actually designed to be captured here, which is always a big no-no in role-playing. Very sparingly depower your players, and especially capturing them. They don't have to be, but it's almost designed in the story to be that way. Eventually they make it to their f actual first dungeon, the Dragon Hatchery, which I think they're level 3 by the time they even get in here. Um, which is also weird, there's no like newbie dungeon crawl at all. Uh, but it's it's a nice dungeon. Again, it's I think this might be an actual 5-foot square map dungeon, one of the few... Uh, yeah, in the game, which is nice to see. There's not too many of these, and coincidentally, it's one of the best-looking and operating dungeons in Roll20. No complaints here. Then the biggest complaint happens, which is we go to Episode 4. Episode 4 is a disaster to try to do in Roll20, and frankly, in any scenario, because you, it is a giant road trip. You're making your way from Greenest all the way up to, essentially, between Waterdeep and Neverwinter, and I'll show you that by shifting over to the Sword Coast map. This is a nice map. I like the art style used here. Um, it covers both adventures all take place in this area. This is obviously the most well-known area of uh, the Forgotten Realms is the Sword Coast. A bonus feature that Roll20 um, provides pretty much standard throughout all the uh, all their paid modules is that they put all the actual map notations on the GM layer so then you can switch them to the token layer uh, allowing your players to then see it. And you can see it's pretty obvious when it's on the GM and when it's on the token layer. Now, this works really well on things like, you know, Strahd or Tomb of Annihilation, the other thing, the other modules that I've covered um, for review, because your players do not know that area. It's an unknown area, and, and a lot of the adventure is designed to explore this land of the unknown. The Sword Coast is like the most popular, well-known area of the entire continent. So it feels 
very, very bizarre to me that your players, for example, would not know the location of Baldur's Gate or Waterdeep or Neverwinter. This these areas are very well mapped. This whole area is very, very well mapped. So <laughs> in terms of like hiding that information, that's completely unnecessary. Now, I do like that that's an option. I would rather have the option to put it on the GM layer than not. So that's good. But I would probably go through and add, push, put all of these on the token layer, let your players look at all these areas, and then hide some of them, like the Well of Dragons. There's a few areas that um, become important that your players don't know are important that you could hide, maybe like Parnast and those kind of things. But for the most part, even dungeons aren't actually on this map, like the Castle Neratar or the Hunting Lodge. Like those areas, unlike even Fandelver, where they you know put those X's on the map, those aren't here. And I would love as a DM to be able to add them on here to show like, okay, yeah, you're, here's the here's that um, hidden swamp castle that you guys conquered, and I'm going to put that on the map now so you remember that location. Uh, those aren't on here, but instead all the standard locations are, so it's kind of a good and bad here. But you can see the location. So it starts off in greenest, and I'll go to the uh, measurement tool so we can see. Let's zoom out a bit. And you eventually make your way up to Elturil. Uh, at some point here, you actually meet up with the caravan. I think it might be here. And then you go to Baldur's Gate. Then you go up the coastway to meet up with the tradeway and go all the way up to Waterdeep. And then from there, you continue all the way up the Sword Coast into the Mare of Dead Men. This is approximately 1,000 mile journey. That is crazy. And obviously, that's a straight path, which you won't be taking a straight path. You'll be following the road. So that is a mess of a, of a section to try to run as a DM, especially on a virtual tabletop, because you just don't have the maps like you you know and what so what roll 20 does is they provide these extra maps which you can use like this forest uh road map um i think it's designed for before you meet up with the caravan so specific specifically uh driving through this initial area from between greenest and eltero probably uh or even between like maybe the coastway and then you've got when you meet up with the caravan and you follow them you've got these uh battle maps which this one is a little specific because it literally has like the sea of swords on the left side uh so it would make sense for when you're in water deep in this and apologize for switching back and forth so quickly but i think it's designed for this area you might be able to use it here but i don't think you're supposed to be able to actually have the water that close uh so it's you know it's good and bad for various reasons i'm, I'm very glad they included on there and even the little uh, wagon tokens are a nice touch. There's actually day and night versions of both of these. And also, you can see there's the night one, which looks really nice. Uh, and they all do have dynamic lighting on there. You'll just have to uh, enable it. One weird thing I noticed that this module does, I've never seen this done like this before, but all the trees are X'd out instead of a circle or a line. And it looks weird. I'm not going to set it up right now, but it, it looks like somebody drew an X to make it that the blocker. I don't. I have no idea why that's done like that. It's. I've never seen that used before in any of the other modules, but it's used consistently in all the maps here on uh, Tyranny of Dragons. All the trees, specifically just trees, are X'd out. It's, that is bizarre to me. Uh, you can also use this campfire map uh, for when the caravan makes camp, which is pretty nifty. So I'm very glad those are included because otherwise this would be an absolute mess to try to cover. Obviously there's all these uh, events. Some of them are scripted events that should happen, which introduce important NPCs that are used later, which is really nice. And other times they're just random events that's supposed to hit the players. But this is just a large section. And frankly, if I was a DM, I would want to get through this as quickly as possible. Just do the scripted road events and then do as few of the random ones as needed because ouch, it's just... It's just painful. Um, they do finally make, and that's pretty much the most of the middle section. Uh, finally, we make it to the swamp area. Uh, you get through one dungeon, the Karnath uh, Roadhouse, which quickly leads to um, trap sizing through the swamp, which you get a nice little random battle map of a swamp you can use. And again, what I like that they did, they didn't just throw a bunch of random battle maps on there. They actually looked at what kind of maps this adventure would require in terms of needing these extra battle maps, and they provided that. And they did the same thing in Rise of Tiamat. So you actually get, you know, because you will be in a swamp. So they give you a swamp map. You will be traveling by a road with a caravan. So they give you this road map with a caravan on there. You'll be battling in towns. So they give you a town map. Uh, that's a huge plus also. It's not just that they're random battle maps. It's that they're actually... Um, tailored to the kind of maps and locations that you'll need, which is a big plus. Um, Castle Neratar. Now, 
this kind of is a good example of why the maps are just too goddamn big. <laughs> uh, this is the big dungeon in the middle of the swamp that you come across uh, after your grueling road trip. Look at the freaking size of this thing. It's insane. You can see the bigger squares are the original 20-foot um, uh, map grids, and so Roll20 has used 5-foot, because if you don't use 5-foot square grids, tactical combat just completely falls apart. Like, it just does not work with 5th edition system. Like, you need those 5-foot square grids, otherwise it's just... Like, otherwise, why use a tactical battle map, basically? Apparently, Wizards did not uh, think of that or think that way with um, using a virtual tabletop in this way, which, you know, again, a lot of D&D has used Theater Mind, that's fine, but I'm specifically looking at, as somebody that primarily only basically plays D&D with online uh, tabletop and Roll20, this is not good. It's <laughs> All the tokens are teeny tiny. Luckily, the map is a high enough resolution where you can zoom in, which you will need to, but it makes for a gigantic map for DMs and players to try to keep track of. I and mean, your players are going to see all this blackness, uh, you know, when they get to a map, and it's just going to be horrifying to try and navigate, and I think just the map is too damn big, I mean, that's, look at that, that's horrific, <laughs> um, and the map is multiple sections, it's it's just gigantic, and I feel like it's a lot of uh, unused empty space, particularly out here in the swamp land, like, holy crap, that's crazy, uh, and here the linearity really starts hitting, and I think it works actually really well, and it would work well for my group. You, you go from the castle, literally they find a teleporter in the dungeon, um, they teleport to mountains, like on the other side of the Sword Coast map. Uh, wait for that to load in for a second. And unfortunately, that's the other bummer, is these maps are huge, so loading in and map size and all that could definitely be a factor here. Um, and they explore the hunting lodge, they could ally themselves with a potential cult, member from there they go to the town of Parnast which actually oddly is a gridded town map most uh, maps I've seen in roll 20 are not gridded this just happens to be a um, smaller map so you could actually battle on this map although as you see you'll need to zoom in quite a bit <laughs> uh, and Parnast has a literally a giant cloud giant castle parked uh, floating like right next to it and that that's a really cool finale it's it's got uh, like a, a white dragon lair, it's got a vampire hanging out, um, obviously the cloud giant master is there, it's a really neat uh, map, it's could be hard to visualize in terms of navigation, because it's like a three dimensional uh, I don't know if that one's here or not, and you can see here, now here the scale kind of works better, because okay, it's, it's a giant lair it's designed for giants, so I can see why everything would be huge, but still like good lord, that's a lot of open space uh for courtyard, where is I'm trying to look? There's a spot, maybe it's the final one. Ice tunnels. Oh, okay. Well, there's a spot where it shows. Oh, that's just the dragon's lair, yeah. And this one works a little better because you can see it's like little rooms punctuated by a giant one. This feels very much like the, the hobbit with smog on his giant uh, gold lair. There's a it's supposed to be a miniature map. Let's see. But yeah, I mean, these are three. This is all the same dungeon. I can't find it. Okay, well, there's a side view somewhere. Maybe it's over here that shows how that's designed. Introduction to episode 8. No, those are just cool pictures. Uh, and obviously, you've got all the. There we go. Castle Reach side view. Okay, that's what I was looking for as a handout. Um, so it's kind of a unique. Uh, set up the upper courtyard like half over the lower courtyard and then the tunnels kind of connecting them which could be a little confusing so just make sure you're aware of how that dungeon is actually interconnected but uh, it's a neat dungeon design like there's a lot going on um, I like it but again it suffers from the same like holy crap this is a giant battle map and again especially if this is your only like roll 20 experience you're either dealing a lot of non-grids or like giant maps with tiny token grids, so it's not very well represented of how good tactical battle maps in Roll20 can be. Uh, and it's not, none of that's Roll20's fault, and in fact they fixed the problem, which is um, subdividing the grids and, and continuing to use 5 foot grids so that you can actually use it in a battle map. Uh, otherwise it would be just horrifyingly disastrous here. Uh, but yeah, it's still, I mean, it's still a weirdly designed map. I'm also not a fan of the parchment style art which is something that I think uh, Out of the Abyss does this also, where it, 
it just doesn't look like a map you would actually battle on. It looks like a map you would, you know, sit there and look at and unfold, which works great if you're not battling on the map physically in a tabletop format, but if you are, then I'd rather prefer the uh, designs that are found in, like, Curse of Strahd, Annihilation, and uh, Tomb of Annihilation, and Princess of the Apocalypse, which look like they're actual tactical battle maps with just more aesthetically pleasing details and not all these extra little, like, stained pages and things on there. <laughs> uh, so overall, part of the Dragon Queen, it begins and ends strongly. Uh, the random battle maps, uh, they they prove invaluable in stages that lack any maps, in particular that whole middle section with the caravan. It is very linear, um, which some groups may actually appreciate, uh, and it doesn't provide necessarily a satisfying ending to the overall Dragon Cult plot. You, you do end up with either a flying cloud giant castle just in your possession, or you could crash the castle, which makes for an epic climax. So it does have an ending, but obviously if you want to continue the story of the plot of the Dragon Cult, you will need the rise of Tiamat. Switch over to that one. Alright, so Rise of Tiamat. What do you get with the 2995 module? You get two 10-foot battle maps with 5-foot subdivisions. Obviously, everything has got dynamic lighting built in again if you're a Roll20 subscriber. Three 15-foot battle maps with 5-foot subdivisions. One 20-foot battle map with 5-foot subdivisions. Yes, that's right. There's not a single native 5-foot freaking battle map in the whole uh, package. They're all 10, 15, or 20. Ugh. You get one overland map of the Sword Coast, which is, I think, the exact same map as Horde of the Dragon Queen. Uh, you do get six five-foot original battle maps by Roll20, and they're not the exact same. They are, like I said, tailored to the locations that you will find in Rise of Tiamat. So this, this time, I think two of them are the same, the town and forest, um, which pretty much you're going to find in any adventure. But you also now get a tavern, uh, an ice flow, volcano, and evil temple, which obviously are all locations very tailored to Rise of Tiamat's locations. You get the interactive council scorecard page, which I'll go to that in a second. Uh, the journal organized into nine episodes, each containing various uh, DM notes and player handouts that you will need. You do get organized DM notes for all the ally factions and races, and I like the way they're all divided up like this, so you can quickly uh, grab whatever information you need on either a villainous organization or one of the official, uh, what are they called, factions, I guess, of the uh, Forgotten Realms. Uh, you get 16 named NPC sheets with matching tokens, 14 with picks and handouts. You get nearly 100 NPC monster sheets with draggable tokens, vision, and separate player handouts. 37 magic item player handouts, 12 of which have pictures. And then the typical rollable tables for random encounters and treasure hordes, and the standard rules document searchable database. So you've got even more uh, macros in place here for all the different treasure hordes you can have, as well as uh, the random encounters. So Rise of Tiamat works better. <laughs> um, it starts off at like 7th or 8th level. It's designed to come off from Horde of the Dragon Queen into Rise of Tiamat. However, you don't need to play the first one. As long as your players are the right level, you could probably summarize Horde of the Dragon Queen in a few sentences, honestly. Like, the plot really picks up in Rise of Tiamat as your players take a more active role. The biggest thing is that Rise of Tiamat involves a lot of political... like machinations and maneuverings which your players will either love or loathe um, I think things like Game of Thrones proved that people like that kind of thing but your players have to be willing to role play it like there's there's vast sections of this adventure that are designed purely for role playing and that's why Rise of Tiamat doesn't have a whole lot of maps because these, these are not designed to be battle maps they're designed to be just role playing scenarios uh, obviously, if your players get into fights more often or just want to dungeon crawl a lot, then Rise of Tiamat might not be uh, as suitable and may even be less suitable than Horde of the Dragon Queen, frankly. Um, it's And because of the way it's got a lot of role-playing, it feels a little light on the content. You can see, like, the fact that I can see all the official maps on this one page, that's all you get right here, is just uh, you get your Sword Coast. Uh, was that one, two, three, four, five, six? Boy, that that seems really really low for a thirty dollar adventure. And again, that's just the uh, that's the official published adventure. That's that's how many maps uh, you had to begin with. Now these are very very large maps. These will take a while to get through, uh, in its defense. And we'll go through uh, briefly the Sword Coast map. Pretty much the exact same. Um, it starts off, and again the plot is weird because you're basically it's still despite having this world ending threat and you coming together with the Waterdeep Council, which is 
um, the way it's organized episode one and I think five are designed to be sprinkled out throughout which is meeting with the uh, Council of Waterdeep multiple times where you actually uh, try to gather allies and perform different missions and do role playing uh, and literally it comes up on the scorecard which I'll show at the end um, and then episode 5 is designed as uh, Retaliations by the Cult which they do the exact same thing in Princes of the Apocalypse which is the adventure, the campaign that I ran uh, last year uh, it seems like, just reading through this Princes actually had the, the, the cults attack various towns so the players had to go save them which felt more interesting to me than reading through this one which is just the cult just straight up attacks the heroes they just find them and attack them in a big battle and then, okay, that's that's fine, but I like how Princes did it better. <laughs> uh, so the first time you assault the uh, White Dragon Lair, which I don't know why they immediately went toward this again, because if you remember, we just fought a uh, White Dragon at the uh, Cloud Giant Castle. So now we're going into a stronger White Dragon Lair, essentially, which it's neat. It's an iceberg. There's a whole, uh, and obviously it gives you an ice flow map. Roll 20 provides one because you're supposed to go up to the Spine of the World and... Uh, you go there via ship, and you have to battle through all the different ice creatures, uh, which is nifty. Uh, otherwise, it's it's fine. It's fine. <laughs> There's, you know, one one bummer uh, that Roll20 does that they continue to do. I have to zoom in a lot because, once again, we have a giant-ass map. If a uh, creature doesn't have, if it's like a unique um, type of creature or a variant of a creature, like this ice troll that does not have a picture provided by... Wizards of the Coast or the official module, then Roll20 will do this, where they just give a standard, um, basically a blank token and write the names on there. I don't like that at all. I've never liked that. Um, I would never use that. I would either use a standard troll picture and uh, use the tint feature to tint it blue <laughs> or something, you know? Uh, or I would, like, even Google image search just a slightly different looking troll. Uh, or, you know, in theory, an ice troll, and just use that. I can see, obviously, obvious reasons why Roll20 doesn't want to do that or provide um, extra pictures like that, especially for generic monsters instead of named ones. But uh, And it, it doesn't come up super long. It it's, looks bad here because, again, these are all ice versions of standard creatures. Um, for the most part, you won't see that, but it is a bummer when you do see that. Um, the other option they could do, and I'm just giving suggestions at this point, make them rollable tokens. Put the Put the troll... Uh, as one side, and then as Ice Trolls another. That would kind of give you the best of both worlds. Um, we're going to move on to... And this one is less like you're going from one to the other as you keep going back to like Waterdeep and getting missions and going to the next one. You you hunt down basically the leaders of the cult uh, who are all in various different situations. This one, uh, Varum, I think, has been uh, essentially captured by a bunch of yuan Ti. Um, who have made a hideout in the back of this mummy lair. Uh, which this one... And again, these the ones that are smaller, that look like actual dungeons, work the best, I think. Uh, it just, you know, translates a lot better than the giant-ass areas that have outdoor features. Uh, this one is, unfortunately, another big one. Uh, and this one is you're just hunting down... Yet another leader who happens to have a green dragon that will straight up harass your party at the entrance of the dungeon as well as further in, depending on if your uh, characters do the right thing to try and sneak their way inside. Uh, you also get a message from one guy who's trying to betray his cult, even though he's got like a fake dragon mask, which, again, you're trying to... It, the plot is not... <laughs> I'm not going to go into it, but it's, it's very simple. It's like there's an evil cult, they've got these magic items, they're trying to bring back uh, Tiamat... And that's basically the plot. You're just trying to to capture or uh, turn those uh, cult leaders into your favor. And everything you do is going to appear on that scorecard at the end. It basically determined how difficult the final battle is, which is, I think, something Dragon Age Origins did pretty much exactly. <laughs> that was, like, the big climax there. Is like they went down and, like, okay, what all did you do? What choices did you make? Which factions did you ally with? Which ones did you piss off? And that determines the troops you get for the final battle and how difficult that scenario is. I think that's exactly how Dragon Age Origins played out. <laughs> which was, you know, itself based on D&D, as pretty much every RPG is. Uh, so it's coming full circle now, back to D&D. <laughs> uh, Zonthal's Tower is probably my favorite dungeon of the group. Um, area. It's a wizard's tower surrounded by a 
uh, Hedge Maze, which is basically a collection of mini encounters, which is really neat. And they kind of did this with the shrines for Tomb of Annihilation, where they just had them um, all on the same map but boxed off from each other. One issue I found is I would prefer these were used as three separate maps rather than all being on the same map screen, which is the dungeons, the tower, the dungeons beneath the tower, the tower, and the uh, the hedge maze itself. And plus, these little arrows pointing out and in, they need to be shut off with dynamic lighting also. Like, there's no reason your player should see the void of the universe outside, which is a nothing. So, I'm good. obviously, these need to be boxed off. They were, but these need to be actually closed off, too. And frankly, I would have just put all of this on a map and then this on a map, mainly because it just looks weird when your players are exploring this and, they're gonna, again, they're going to see that giant blackness. It's impossible not to metagame somewhat on Roll20 because you just see, you know, the visual aspects of every single battle of every map, at least in size. And they see this going, oh, shit, there's a giant hedge maze. Well, it's actually just these little individual sections that they're going to pop around to. And it's going to be difficult to drag them from one to the other, um, particularly because they could end up seeing other sections you don't want them to see. So you have to, like, move them to the GM layer and then move them and then do all that and all that. So that's kind of a mess. Especially with going from here to here to there. So that's, that's a little nitpicky. I mean, again, they boxed all the dynamic lighting is correct. Um, but I still would have preferred this to have been separated a little bit. And would have at least made this look like it had more content than it does. <laughs> um, and then finally you end up in the Well of Dragons, which is a uh, volcano. Uh, inside a volcano where you can use the new volcano map that Roll20 provides, which is really cool looking. This is a really cool map, actually. Uh, and actually lit up properly, which is nice. And there's even uh, random battle maps for the final temple, which is cool if you want to zoom in and use those. And again, I, I would definitely take advantage of all these battle maps because I do not like the scaling on the final maps. Look at how freaking huge the temple... And I know Tiamat is a gargantuan token, like, fine, but that means it's going to take up, like, this much room, which, frankly, is just going to make Tiamat look small. <laughs> like, that's... You know, sizing is everything. If you make this half the size, then when you put Tiamat on the map, players can be like, holy shit, look at the size of this giant five-headed dragon goddess. Whereas here, you put it on there, and you're like, okay, yeah, that's this is just a gigantic area, and there's a, another token. <laughs> that's not Roll20's fault. Again, it's, it's the adventure. It just does not particularly look or translate well to a physical tabletop space very much at all. Um, despite these issues... Uh, I do think that Rise of Tiamat translates a bit better to the virtual tabletop format. Um, the parts that don't have maps, which are episode one, uh, five, let's see, so two is the ice, three and four are those dungeons. Yeah, five is the cult retaliations, which those would actually be really tricky because you do not have maps for those, and those are specifically designed for attacks. So you could use some of the random battle maps, but frankly, like, some of them involve a giant, like, army with a yeah, like adult black dragon and multiple demons and shit, like, I don't know, I think you'd have to come up with your own battle maps for that, and plus, they can literally occur anywhere, which is a nice little bit of freedom that the adventure gives you and suggests, like, hey, you can do this indoors, you can do it outdoors, you can do it where the players feel safe, um, but I don't know, like, you couldn't really use the tavern map and just have, like, a adult black dragon, well, maybe you could, there's some outdoor section, <laughs> so you could kind of play with that a bit as the map slowly loads, um, and then the other ones are episode, uh, there it goes, episode six and eight, which are designed specifically your players go somewhere, meet with a uh, interesting faction, and then have to get either information and or alliances with said faction. And this happens with the Metallic Dragons, where they meet with literally a council of good dragons, and to Thay, which Thay is tricky because a lot of goody goody heroes would not want at all to ally with Thay. Thay is bad news bears. They're I think they're run by a lich now and it's they're kind of they're supposed to be neutral but they're they honestly look like star trek villains like they're just kind of evil wizards essentially i mean look at that that's that is a star trek villain <laughs> faction uh, and none of those have maps which again you don't need maps assuming your players are okay with role playing all these situations which is what they should be but again that doesn't necessarily translate well to what roll 20 uh is and can do so, yeah, the bad map scaling and parchment-like design is a big turnoff when using um, battle maps as a virtual tabletop, and the strict linearity, linearity could turn off many a D&D uh, &D group who prefers a more open sandbox world to explore, which pretty much uh, the later adventures all go more in a direction. I don't think any 
other published D&D campaign has been nearly as linear as Tyranny of Dragons has been. However, your group may like that. And, I like, my group, I think, frankly, would like a linear adventure. It's, you know, that when faced with, like, a sandbox thing, your players are like, I, I don't know, I need, like, you know, I want, like, a video game style quest log or something, which is how I did things to make it more, um, like, here's what you should be doing. Essentially a way of hand-holding a little bit just to give players nudge in the right direction. Uh, this one, you don't have to do that at all. It's basically just... Um, you know, here's your next mission. Uh, or the Dragon Queen, even more so, because it's just one happens after the other, but here it's, you could do a little quest system, be like, okay, well, here's your quest, which is to go to these massive dungeons and just tackle them. Uh, so, you know, it just depends on what your group likes. Uh, if you are going to play Tyranny of Dragons, and you can stomach the map scaling on Roll20, uh, the way the maps translate to it, then I, this is definitely the way to go. Oh, man, I almost missed the entire scorecard. Let me go back there. I'm sitting here doing my wrap-up. Okay, Council Scorecard. This is neat. This is probably the neatest thing that Rise of Tiamat does as a module, um, both the official campaign and what Roll20 does, which is essentially translates all the choices your players make in terms of uh, what they do in the dungeons as well as uh, how they operate all the various uh, political meetings into literally a mechanical point system, which is so very D&D. &D. <laughs> just D&D &D is just turning story into math and then math into story. It's that's <laughs> that's basically how I would describe it. And this is just a total representation of that. You can see all the different things that your players do, which I believe, yeah, all of this is actually um Horde of the Dragon Queen, which I think there's a way uh I think it depends on the asterisks, which is uh if your players don't play Horde of the Dragon Queen, what happens there? Which is a bit like the, like, you know, playing Mass Effect 2 and making those decisions, like, okay, what happened here? <laughs> um, and it literally tallies up into points for all of these, and Roll20 does it. I'll have to zoom in a little bit, because I'm so zoomed out for dealing with those giant maps. Uh, literally, these are rollable tokens, so you can choose a side and then roll the numbers <laughs> and just choose your tally total from there. That works well. What doesn't work quite as well is that all the little pluses and minuses, which are designed to be uh, essentially just a yes-no with yes being a 1 and no being a 0 is they're all on the GM layer so you'd have to click there do here and want you I mean try to look at the different system it's like slightly grayed out and I put on the token layer and now it's black which does not look like much of a difference at a glance I can barely tell a difference I'd have to like oh yeah okay I did that so I would not necessarily recommend doing it that way um, I would recommend either just moving it off oops okay, wait gym layer like keeping them up here and then moving them there as they plus and minus happen or you could obviously delete them off there but i think you have a limited number like if you delete all these things off there you won't have any more <laughs> and i think it even says like don't do that um i would move them off the screen and then move them in as you need them and you could even leave them on the gm layer the cool part about this and obviously there's a total down here that requires um what each faction needs number wise because this is set up as an actual map on roll 20 you could, as a DM, move your players onto this scorecard and let them see it. A lot of DMs would balk at that. They want to keep that information to themselves. Obviously, that could be immersive immersion breaking if your players see this information. I would at least open it up during... I always do like an epilogue scene after the campaign, which I just show all the maps and be like, hey, here's what you guys did and didn't do. Or you could do it during the final climax, and once the totals match up and different factions say yay or nay with helping them maybe your players are upset that some factions didn't help them like oh i thought we did enough you could even move them over to the screen and be like okay here's here's how it literally adds up you want to show your hand a little bit i you know you don't have to do that but i think that's a neat option that roll 20 does allow because you're sitting here doing all this within roll 20 itself which is which is kind of cool and, and this is a neat option i like that this is here um for this uh so plus one for rise of tiamat for including that uh definitely of the two rise of tiamat is the more exciting adventure uh, I think it could be played as a high-level campaign on its own. And again, you could just summarize the events of Horde of the Dragon Queen. So it's, you know, it's fine. I don't, just overall, I think it gets a little messy with this whole adventure. Um, all right, let's do... Go back to that page. Pros and cons uh, for my Roll20 review of Tyranny of Dragons. So, uh, pros... Uh, Horde of the Dragon Queen and Rise of Tiamat can be purchased separately. I would definitely consider that as a uh, pro. You can just grab one of them for 30 bucks and uh, supplement your own material, or maybe you only want to stop at like 8th level. 
uh, or or conversely, do Rise of Tiamat if you've already got uh, a group of higher levels. You could just do that one. Uh, the original Roll Twenty random battle maps are an excellent inclusion, perfect for providing random encounters and in filling out sections that don't feature any set maps. I do hope from now on, uh, Roll Twenty does include these. I think that would be uh, amazing to include these on all of their. Uh, uh, adaptations, the, the paid modules, because they're a nice addition. I like that they're specifically tailored to the various uh, regions that you'll need. Uh, so big thumbs up, but I think in particular they work really well for the Tyranny of Dragon storyline, because you do not... Compared to other campaigns, it feels very light on official battle maps, so it's very nice that these are there, and there are sections that just straight up do not have enough maps. <laughs> uh, other pro, the Sword Coast map has all the location names and markers on the GM layer, letting you use it as an interactive player map. Again, um, it feels odd that you would do it that way, because, again, I think your players would know all those. Maybe it's their first introduction to Forgotten Realms, and you want to be like, okay, here's this location, here's this location. You know, it's neat to have that option, but your players, you know, <laughs> would definitely know that region, unless none of them are from the Sword Coast. Uh... And the Interactive Council Scorecard from Rise of Tiamat is a big pro. It lets you keep tracks of events within Roll20 uh, with the added bonus that you could choose to show it to your players at the end if you so choose. The cons. Most maps do not natively use 5-foot square grids. Now, Roll20 adjustments uh, does fix the sizing issue, and that results in very large maps with tiny tokens. I just think it's a... The map scaling is just not good for Tyranny of Dragons, and it does not translate particularly well for uh, Roll20. Uh, neither module comes with very many dungeon maps. Many of Rise of Tiamat sections are designed as role-playing only, while the middle of Horde of the Dragon Queen uh, relies on random encounters on the road, which is a bummer on both. So it just feels like they are both a little light on content compared to uh, other official published campaigns. Uh, and finally, pretty nitpicky, but the three areas of Xanthal's Tower and Rise of Tiamat, uh, I would rather those be on three separate battle maps rather than all on one. So, final verdict. The Roll20 module provides many uh, welcoming extra features that help elevate the otherwise weakest campaign in the 5th edition Pantheon. Thank you everyone uh, for watching this video review. You can see my written review at roguewatson.com and you can follow our own D&D adventures here on my YouTube channel. Thank you.